All right, so welcome back to Physics 325, week nine, video two of two for this week. Last video, we talked about the Jones calculus. We talked about representing polarization mathematically. If we recall, we have a monochromatic beam propagating along the Z direction. There's a plane, the XY plane in this case, along which the electric field is allowed to oscillate. And the description of the oscillation of that electric field along that plane is what we call a, pol a polarization. Uh, there was a um, Jones vector, which talked about the amount of field in the x direction or the versus the y direction, which we call the horizontal and vertical bases. And there were elements that we acted on uh, these Jones vectors to map one to the other that uh, led to polarizing elements that changed the polarization state. And today, we're not going to treat this so abstractly. We're going to look at the physical mechanism uh, through which this might actually happen. So we're going to look at polarizing devices. Let's think about what we actually need to have a polarizing device. What are the basic requirements? Well, effectively, if it's going to change the polarization, it better act differently on one polarization versus the other. So we need something which is going to look different optically for electric fields wiggling along X, say, than Y. We need to therefore exploit, uh, exploit some asymmetry in materials. And we're going to look at two ways of doing this. We're going to look at uh, human-made, uh, engineered devices, and we're going to look at stuff that happens naturally in nature that will act as polarizing uh, polarizers. We've already seen one case when we're reflecting something off glass. That's a very uh, awkward way of making a polarizer. You'd have to have it just at, right, at the right angle, and you don't really get to select how much light gets reflected off. It turns out there's better ways. So we're going to explore some of those uh, today. And there are devices that occur naturally that also exhibit this polarizing effect. Uh, based on just their physical properties. Okay, so let's start with one type of polarizing element, uh, a polarizer. Now, when we say polarizer, we're going to mean something specific. We talked about it last time in video one, where we're letting through one particular polarization and blocking the other. And let's look at a physical construction, a very simple way of making uh, one such device. It's called a wire grid polarizer. Literally, this is just a bunch of wires. Okay, so that we have... Um, a bunch of wires, say, aligned along a given direction. They're spaced by D. And we have an electric field. Let's think about what happens for an electric field. Remember, we have a plane wave illuminating this thing. We can break it down to a component going up and down along the wire. And light, which is going perpendicular to that, this way. Okay, so let's think about what happens in each case. Well, if we have light which is wiggling this way, the polarization is going up and down, that's literally an electric field up and down. That corresponds to a voltage in some sense. We're driving a current. This is like a, a voltage in a circuit. We're driving a current up and down and up and down these wires. So there's a large uh, conductance. We're actually going to be driving currents this way as we do that. And as we know from electronics, as we're driving these currents, we're losing energy, we're dissipating energy to joule heating and things like that. We're going to get a large absorption of this direction of polarization uh, uh, because of these currents. However, light that's going this way, we cannot drive currents through it. There's none of this loss associated with driving currents, so we get no conductivity, and light is going to go through. Okay, So the conductivity is really what causes this to occur. And if we're polarized along this wire grid, we're going to have huge absorption for our light, and perpendicular to it, we will completely transmit our light. So first of all, in order for this to work, we need to have this spacing much less than a wavelength. Why? Well, if not, what we've basically done is just made something called a diffraction grating, and we'll just have these diffraction effects. So we need d much less than lambda for this to occur. And for that reason, it was previously said that it was uh, Kind of impossible for optical wavelengths uh, because it would be very difficult to align these wires that were, say, 10 nanometers apart. Now, nowadays, you can do it with lithography. You can make these kind of nanofabricated substances. In fact, we can do it downstairs in the Elliott building in the uh, nanofab facilities using the SEM and lithography. Um, so that's something that you can do. Um, however, it's still difficult. And it's generally more, more uh, challenging for optical wavelengths. It works perfect for microwaves for which the wavelengths are like this. The second thing is there's a misconception about this. Like when, you, when I first saw this, I remember thinking this, that somehow the, the light uh, somehow sneaks through that's polarized this way, can kind of fit through those uh, wires, but it gets blocked if it's not polarized along there. 
And this is wrong for two reasons. First of all, it's wrong because light doesn't work that way. It's not like it goes punk and gets uh, blocked there. It's, uh, we know now that it's a super, this would even be a superposition of these two polarizations. But even worse, this gives you the wrong answer. Notice that the light that gets through is uh, perpendicular to these grids from we can see uh, that we can see from this picture. So it's not so much that the, the, the grids block the light, it's just that this has a large absorption due to the currents. Okay, so I mentioned this is hard for optical wavelengths, yet we have polarizers. Here's some polarizers right here. And if I rotate them, I'm going to get a different amount of polarization through. So how are these things made? Well, they're made uh, uh, by what are called these polaroid, uh, polaroid sheets. Effectively, what you do is you take a particular type of molecule, a rapathite or uh, some kind of vinyl that's infused in plastic. So you have these molecules, and these molecules themselves are very long and needle-like, right? And you put infuse them in plastic, and then you stretch out the plastic, heat it up, stretch it out very, very thin. At the same time, you're either inducing these mechanical stresses that are aligning them, or you apply a strong magnetic field. But either way, you're basically making all these aligned molecules, which are easily sub-lambda, effectively mimicking this uh, situation here, okay? And that's the most common type of polarizer for optical wavelengths. Here's what some of these molecules look like. Here's a model of them, these very long needle-like molecules. You apply a field while you're stretching out and melting the plastic into a thin sheet, and you arrive at a polarizer, which you can now buy uh, off the shelf. This is what these polarizing sheets look like. And that's what the majority of optical polarizers are made out of. So these are engineered sources. Let's look at some natural occurring sources of polarization. So let's think about how we can, uh, how something in nature could employ this asymmetry. It can react differently uh, on EX versus EY. Now recall what our index of refraction actually came from. What causes absorption and dispersion? What's our index of refraction? And recall what that came from. It came from our, our innocent little Lorentz model. We had the electron uh, was a mass on a spring. And that was kind of like saying that we effectively have this, uh, this positively charged core, very heavy core. The electron had some spring, or spring constant k, which was what it was at n omega squared. Um, but we, this led to some natural frequency. Um, the natural frequency of the spring was root k over n. So it's basically a simple harmonic oscillator approximation. That's what we physicists do, right? Spherical cows, or everything is a mass on a spring, if it's not, if it's not a spherical cow. But uh, this was our basic idea for our Lorentz model, and that gave us the index of refraction. Now imagine we had a, a molecule for which um, the spring was different in different directions, right? We can have different spring constants in different directions, so it looks something more like this. Now if we had a situation like that, where we have a uh, different uh, spring constant along x, in other words, the electron felt a restoring force to equilibrium, based on its surroundings that was different along x versus y versus z, uh, you would have different frequencies um, for which the resonance has occurred. Therefore, we'd have different uh, absorption wavelengths and different uh, phase shifts for different directions of the electric field for different polarizations. We get something like this when we looked at our real and imaginary parts, right? So notice here that in this case, we have different absorption. There's particular wavelengths for which the absorption is different along x than it is along y. That is what we call dichroism. Dichroism is where you have different absorption for different indices of refraction. Similarly out here, the effect is minute, but if we zoom in, we can see there's different phase shifts, there's different real parts of the index of refraction. And remember that real part of the index of refraction is our classic n from first year physics. The index of refraction, the real part is um, C over N is what the velocity is in the medium. So, and that gives us our different phase shifts. So our different imaginary parts gives us our different absorption. That's our polarizers. Our different phase shifts, our different real parts of the index of refraction, it's like we have a different N, a different speed of H versus V polarized light. And we call that birefringence, okay? So this is what we can get. So again, we're, we're kind of going up, um, building up a picture, we're still, kind of abstract, right? We have masses on springs. So let's look at a physical example where we might have this. A classic example is calcite, okay? So here's what a uh, calcite, a uh, set of calcite molecules looks like. So what is calcite? It has uh, three oxygens, a calcium, uh, and a carbon. 
And we can look at the atomic structure in this thing here. So you see this? If we look very carefully, these three oxygens in our, uh, are all in a plane here. And then we have uh, that forms kind of a pyramid with the calcium up top. So we have the three oxygens in a plane, calcium up top, and the carbon's just kind of hanging out doing its own thing uh, close to the center of that plane. And this is what kind of a unit cell of this calcite uh, molecule looks like and uh, substance looks like. And we can just see this repeated again and again and again. So as it's a crystalline structure, so it's periodic, and each cell looks like this. So what does that tell us? So, so let's think about this just intuitively first. Before we go into the details, let's think about this. Intuitively, if we're sending light up the middle, say the middle um, um, perpendicular to that plane given by the oxygens, no matter which way the field is looking, which way the polarization is, it's going to look pretty much the same. Plane of oxygens, spacing, plane of oxygens, spacing, plane of oxygen. Okay, we'll call that uh, Nx. Now, what happens if we go orthogonal to that direction? Well, one for one polarization, we're going to be also Nx. It's going to be along that plane. But another polarization will see something fundamentally different. It will not see a plane of, of oxygen atoms. It'll see a calcium oxygen, calcium oxygen, calcium oxygen. And it'll see a complete, it'll almost be like it's in a different crystal. Okay? So because there's this axis of symmetry here, we have uh, what's called an optical axis. And that optical axis is the one for which it looks the same uh, optically. And if we go perpendicular to that optical axis, we're going to have two different indices of refraction because we effectively have two different crystals. We have one uh, which is a bunch of um, oxygen in a plane and another one which looks like oxygen, calcium, oxygen, calcium. Okay, so this is what we're going to see for that uh, calcite uh, material. And we're going to send in light perpendicular to that optical axis and we're going to get different indices of refraction. We can measure it, actually. We can measure it. So perpendicular to that axis, we get 1.65 whatever uh, for, for, for the index of refraction. And it's quite different. Uh, per, uh, parallel to the uh, optical axis, it's 1.48. So you get a heavily birefringent material. Very different indices of refractions based on which direction the polarization is. Okay, so we can do stuff with this. So first of all, what the trick is typically to cut the crystal perpendicular to that optical axis in like a thin uh, little strip, and we send light through. And as we rotate it, we therefore get a different index of refraction um, uh, along one direction versus another. We have a differential phase shift from one polarization to another, and that's what we called a wave plate from before. So a wave plate, remember that, um, when we, how we wrote that, the wave plate was, you know, some overall phase, which we just factored out, and we had a relative phase between the horizontal and the vertical components, and that was our wave plate uh, Jones matrix. Okay, so it gave a relative phase between them. Why would you get a relative phase? Because you've propagated a fixed distance through a different index of refraction for H than for V. So you will get a relative phase between the two. And that's exactly what you get uh, when you cut one of these calcite crystals perpendicular to its polarization axis, okay? So just nomenclature, we have a fast axis and a slow axis. The fast axis is actually the lowest index of refraction. And this makes sense, right? Because the light is going faster there. The higher the index, the slower the light goes. And we have a slow axis. Okay, so you have a fast axis and a slow axis, uh, and that's how these things are aligned. So, so basically, if light is going along the fast axis or it's going along the slow axis, what we'll find is that there's no effect on the light because it's all slowed down, uh, either all slowed down by a factor of 1.6 or all slowed down by a factor of just under 1.5. Uh, either way, it's all slowed down. What's interesting is when your fast axis and your slow axis are aligned at some angle, with respect to your light. Therefore, you're going to have two components of your light, one which are going to get delayed with respect to one another. And this is precisely how we create circularly polarized light. Okay, so let's look at the Jones uh, uh, formalism here. Okay, so this is what the Jones uh, calculus tells us. We can break it down this way. We have EX and EY. And basically what's going to happen is it propagates. We're going to get a differential phase of E to the delta N times K times L. So L is the length of the crystal. And remember that whenever we're propagating through a material, we get NKL or NKZ of phase, right? And we can factor out a global phase and we're left with exactly what we'd expect um, 
for our, our wave plane. Uh, we have the vertical component gets a phase shift, positive or negative, depending on the alignment, uh, with respect to the slow axis. Okay, so that is uh, a wave plane. Now, we can cut it to different lengths. Knowing the difference in index of refractions, we can tune this thing. So if we can, if we cut the crystal such that that phase length, uh, the, the phase shift is pi over two, that's two pi over four, that's a quarter wave, we call that a quarter wave plate. We also get a quarter wave plate if it's three pi over two, or five pi over two, or seven pi over two. Those are all quarter wave plates. If we have an odd integer times pi over two, it's a quarter wave plate. Um, if it's exactly pi over two, we call that a zero order wave plate. If it's 3 pi over 2, it's a second order. 5 pi over 2, it's a, a third order. And uh, we can, in general, have a multi-order wave plate. Either way, it's going to act like a quarter wave plate if we've tuned our length uh, such that the relative phase shift is an odd number of pi divided by 2. Okay, we can also have uh, an integer multiple of pi. So when we do have that integer multi full integer multiple of pi, we have what's called a half wave plate because pi is half of 2 pi, which is a full wavelength, right? Okay, so you can buy these off the shelf. Um, these are what some of them look like. They're usually in these uh, rotation mounts here, and they basically look identical to this, except they're not polarizers in there. They're a thin slice of a birefringent material. Okay. And all we have to do is cut it along the optical axis. But what happens if we don't align light through the optical axis? We just take a chunk of calcite, and we send light, like we're allowed to, along some random direction. What do we get then? We get a very fascinating ref uh, effect known as double refraction, okay? So, so this is a picture of that, and we actually get a double refraction. So what's actually happening here? Well, it, light that's polarized at some any arbitrary angle, we can break it down to light which is polarized perpendicular to the optical axis, like a wave plate, and whatever component is perpendicular to that, all right? The light that's perpendicular to the, the optical axis, like we had, is we call what we call the ordinary ray. And whatever is perpendicular to that, we call the extraordinary ray. And we get this bizarre effect called walk-off, double refraction. You see there's two images here, if you look very closely. And this is very weird and troubling at first, because this seems to violate Snell's law, right? We have a given angle, in this case, the theta is equal to zero in this diagram. And we have refraction at an angle that is not, uh, but two different angles. So only one of them can, can be correct in terms of Snell's law. So what is going on with Snell's law? How is Snell's law violated? And the way it's violated is kind of intuitive when we look at what's actually going on here. Remember we had a birefringent material, so the, uh, along some axis, uh, the, the velocity of wave fronts are faster than along another. So let's look at the Huygens principle here. Right when the light enters this substance, and we're not particularly aligned along the optical axis or perpendicular to it, we're at some random angle, so our light's gonna have some component uh, perpendicular to the optical axis, um, and some component that's perpendicular to that, and the velocity is going to be faster along one direction versus another. Okay, so the ordinary uh, ray that's perpendicular to the optical axis is just going to obey Snell's law like normal, but the other ray will have a component uh, that has part of that fast light, and another component which is along the slow axis, and therefore it's going to not be, it's going to start off as like a little spherical wavelet, but it's going to evolve faster along one direction than another. It will go to these ellipsoidal uh, wave fronts here. And we can see the velocity is going to go up here. And that's exactly what's going on with this wave uh, length here. That's going on, that's how Snell's law is violated. But still, still darn it, we derive Snell's law. How, what went wrong? How did we, uh, how did we go wrong here? And what went wrong is there was a very implicit assumption we made. I kind of slipped it under the radar, but I mentioned it, that uh, later in the course it would come back to bite us a bit. We, we assumed it, an isotropic medium. An isotropic medium is one which looks the same everywhere. And when we assumed that isotropic medium, we used this fact. We used this displacement field, which was due to the total field, the applied field plus the field of the dipoles, uh, and there's a constant of proportionality between them, epsilon. And similarly, we have this susceptibility, okay? So, so remember this, this D field here is uh, the field due to all the atoms. And we made this assumption that it's going to be 
uh, per is the, the, the x part of this field is going to depend only on the x part of this field. Let's write this out in vector form. Um, dx, dy, dz is equal to constant times ex, constant times ey, constant times uh, ez. Uh, and this was true for an isotropic uh, substance. It doesn't matter which way we look. But what about when the value of the x component of that displacement doesn't just depend on ex, but it depends on um, something called uh, some part of ey and some part of ez as well, right? How do we represent that when it's not enough to know what ex is? You have to know what ey and ez is because of um, because of the non-isotropic uh, behavior of this substance. What well, turns out when you do that. You have to replace this, how we're going to make this work. This is no longer a constant, it's a tensor, the dielectric tensor, uh, which describes mixing, I'll just write it up here, which describes mixing of the three components of the field. Okay, So implicit in our Snell's law derivation was an isotropic medium. When we do not have an isotropic medium, we can get a violation of Snell's law. Um, in terms of when you're looking at just the electric field, because there is not a trivial constant proportionality between this, the displacement field and uh, the electric field here. All right, last thing I want to discuss, uh, a very neat topic known as uh, optical activity, which is really the same thing as we had before, birefringence. But all the birefringence we talked about up till now had to do with linear birefringence. Light had a different index of refraction wiggling this way, than this way. And we know something from last lecture that we can represent uh, linearly polarized light as a superposition of right and left polarization. This is what we talked about when we we're talking about changing bases. We can write it this way. So we can also have circular birefringence. Okay, what would that be? What's circular birefringence? Circular birefringence means light that is right circular polarized will have a different index of refraction than left circular polarized light. Okay. Um, why would this be? Well, there's molecules which have chirality to them, so there's a handedness to them. Um, light which is propagating through them will see a different, um, a different index of refraction, or we'll see a different effective spring constant in our model if it's going this way rather than it's going this way as it's corkscrewing through the material, right? So molecules that have a chirality or a handedness uh, have this circular birefringence. There's a very interesting effect that happens when you put in linearly polarized light through them, okay? Linear polarized light is a superposition of right and left circular polarized light. What the angle of that linear light is turns out to be the phase between them. So let's send in our light, which is linearly polarized, and as it enters this chiral medium, right gets slowed down compared to left, and the phase between the right and left components are going to change, is going to change. So that means that we're going to get a rotation of our linearly polarized light. And this is known as optical activity. So here's an example of optical activity. The LCD TV emits polarized light. The glass on the right has uh, no sugar water in it, just normal water. The glass on the left has sugar water in it. As I rotate my polarized sunglasses, we get to a point where the TV light and the normal water is completely blocked out, but the sugar water has been rotated so that it's non-zero. And this is a prime example of optical activity for a chiral substance. Okay, so neat stuff. So let's summarize. Um, we talked about things which are polarizing elements. And we did have some physical mechanism for which uh, light received a different response if it was polarized one way versus another way. All right. So if the absorption was different, we call that dichroism. If the real part of the index or the phase shift was different between the two components, we call that birefringence. So how do we come up with these? First of all, we can make them. For example, a wire grid polarizer or stretched out plastic with certain molecules infused with them, we can make polarizers. We can also just find crystals that naturally have this based on their planes of symmetry. Uh, we'll have a different index of refraction in one direction versus another. Okay, so if we take one of those crystals, we can cut it perpendicular to the optical axis and we get wave plates. If we cut it at some random angle, or if we're sending light through at a random angle, we get this interesting effect known as walk-off or um, double refraction, because some of that light is going to be polarized in a direction, if we look in, in terms of its Huygens wavelet, such that it's faster in one direction versus the other, so is 
the, uh, as the wavefront uh, propagates, it will become elongated like an ellipse and propagate at some angle. And finally, we showed a neat effect uh, due to circular birefringence, namely that due to optical activities, light propagates uh, through an optically active medium, a medium with circular birefringence. Um, there'll be a different phase shift from the right and left circular polarization, and that will lead to a rotation or an optical rotation. So that is this effect of circular birefringence. So that's all the material for polarization. We'll go through uh, another worked example in the final video. Uh, we'll just kind of summarize some of the points. And then we're on to uh, optical imaging, which will be next week. And we'll see you then.